So if you remember, there's this idea called sampling error that we touched on back in week one. And this is the fact that when we use a sample to estimate a parameter, we are going to have a discrepancy between the estimate and the parameter that's simply due to the fact that we have obtained a sample. And if you get this sample instead of that sample, you get a different value. And it doesn't mean those values don't stand in nicely or represent the population, but they're going to be different from one another and different from the population. And this is not a mistake. This is an inherent fact of sampling as a process, right? If I have a, you know, a bag of Skittles and I grab out five of them, like I might get a good representation of all the colors that are in the bag, but maybe I don't get yellow in one grab, right? So the next time I might get three yellows. And so these differences aren't because I'm not sampling at random from the same bag, right? It's the same population, the same bag of Skittles. I'm just going in and grabbing them out. But the fact that I got this sample versus that sample, I get different estimates of like, what are the proportions of the colors in the bag, right? So this happens. So this is why we need to then know something about the sampling distribution to know whether or not a sample statistic is meaningfully different from what we would expect, right? And in that context, meaningfully different, it goes back to what we've learned about the concepts of how many standard deviations do scores need to be away, right? Normally we use that cut point of kind of like two standard deviations. And it's really rooted in the p-value that's obtained, which we'll talk about more in the next lecture. So here, I really need to know how much discrepancy can I expect between samples, right, in my distribution. It's not enough to know what's the center of my distribution, what's the expected value, right? We also need to know about the variability of the distribution, right, because we know sampling error is a thing. So the central limit theorem gives us some information that's really useful here to know about the central value, central tendency, and the variability or measures of dispersion that would characterize the sampling distribution of the mean. So the central limit theorem states that given a population with some mean, mu, and some variance, sigma squared, the sampling distribution of the mean will have a mean of mu sub x bar equal to mu and a variance equal to sigma squared over n and a standard deviation equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. The distribution will approach the normal distribution as n increases. All right, let's take this snip by snip here. So one, population with a mean and variance. All right, so that's direct enough, right? We, it's a population, so we describe the values with Greek letters mu and sigma squared, okay? So the sampling distribution of the mean is now this distribution we're making of the mean for all possible samples of the same size from this population, right? So if I'm talking about my group of 30 taking size three, I've got 27,000 means, right? That describe each of those samples of size three that I could put into this distribution, okay? So that distribution will now have a mean that is the mean of means, mu sub x bar. Remember, subscripts are like name tags. So they identify to whom some value belongs. So here, this mean is the mean of sample means, right? So I got 27,000 sample means, and now I get the average of all those averages. That's mu sub x bar, okay? That value will equal the population mean. How cool is that, right? The variance of the distribution will equal the population variance divided by n. Why does that matter here? Well, because the number that you have in each of your samples. So if I have samples of size three, I can have a more variable distribution than if I have samples of size 300. And so this affects how compact your distribution is going to be. So when you have a variance and you divide it by n, the bigger n is, the smaller the quotient is going to be, all right? Okay, so the bigger your sample size is, the tighter your distributions are going to end up being. Now, the standard deviation then is just square root that whole thing. So we can take sigma and take it out of the square root, right? Because the square root of sigma squared is sigma. So sigma divided by square root n is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And in fact, that's so important, it gets its own name. And the name is the standard error, or more specifically here, the standard error of the mean, because that's the statistic it describes. So standard errors 
are standard deviations of a statistic, okay? Not standard deviations of person scores, standard deviations of a statistic. So here, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean is the standard error of the mean. The standard error of the mean describes the difference on average that we can expect between the means in the distribution and the mean of means in the distribution, right? How far on average are the sample means from the mean of sample means? Just like a standard deviation was how far on average are the scores from the mean of scores, right? Now it's how far are the statistics, the mean, from the mean of the statistics, which is the mean of means, right, on average. Okay, so this gives us some idea about like how far away, how variable can these things be? And when it, are they far enough away that we start to go, ooh, hmm, that sample is really different. Now, as n increases, which is the size of the samples you take, the distribution more quickly converges on normality. And basically, when you get samples of size 25 or 30, the, the sampling distribution of the mean is normally distributed. So that's a nice thing. And we can actually look at a little um, simulator that gives you a nice picture of this. So here's an online simulator, and it allows us to look at how sampling distributions work. So this is a little online simulator that allows us to see what the process of making a sampling distribution is. So here I have a parent population, right? It has a mean and a standard deviation. We see that it's normal with zero skew and kurtosis, right? Nice bell-shaped curve. Now, what I can do is I can draw data, essentially take a sample. So here, let's take a sample. There, I took five scores, right, from my sample. Those five scores have one average. So what is the average of those five scores? Right here. So this drops in. This is a single sample mean from this parent population with sample size of five, right? So we can do that process again take five more scores, we get a new mean. So now we have two sample means down here, right? And we can keep doing this process. We can take five more. Okay, so now I've taken three. Take five more. So now I have four samples of size five. We can do this again. And we can keep doing this. And this is the process of making a sampling distribution. You take a sample, and every time my sample is the same size, size five, I take and get the average of that, and it goes into a new distribution, which is the distribution of sample means, right? So down here, I have my distribution of sample means. And we could say, take this a little faster. So now I just took five more, five more, five more, five more. So now here we go, we keep taking samples. Here I've taken 102 samples of size five. And we see that as we're doing this, this distribution is looking a little more normal, right? This is still got, this is a little kurtotic, right? It's a little too peaked. We see that it doesn't have the nice hill feel. It's kind of like a steep climb, right? But as you keep doing this, this distribution is going to approximate normal, right? As we take a greater number here of samples. Now, in the real world with sampling distributions, remember, the number of samples you take, the number of samples you take, all possible samples of the same size. So you would take as many possible samples of five as you can. So the variable piece is not how many samples you take, but the size of the samples you take. So let's say that we take a different size of sample. Let's say we take samples of size 25. Okay, so now I've got to take 25 scores from my population before I get one sample mean. There was 25 scores. There's my one mean. Okay. And I can take a second sample. So this is going to be another 25 scores to get a second mean. So now I've taken two samples of size 25, right? And there you go. Now, what if I start taking some samples from this? Do you see how tightly these scores remain in the distribution? 
these scores remain very tight in the distribution, right? And so when you're getting samples to size 25, you're staying really close to the actual population mean, right? Now we're not exactly on the mean. If we took the, you know, theoretical sampling distribution, all possible samples of size N, the mean would equal the mean of the parent population. And the standard deviation would equal the standard deviation divided by the square root of N. So five divided by the square root of 25, which is five, five divided by five would be one, right? So we see that these numbers are getting really close to, in fact, what we would expect theoretically, right? And if, as we keep going, so there we go, I added 10,000 more draws and look at this, 16.01, 1.01. So see how, what we define theoretically using the central limit theorem that says the sampling distribution of the mean has a mean equal to the parent population mean and a standard deviation equal to the standard deviation of the parent population divided by the square root of N. And we see that exact process here happening, right? And we see that when we draw the samples that this distribution becomes one, it's very tight. There's very little variability in the distribution of sample means. There's much more variability in the parent population why? Because these are individuals. So you have some individuals who are extreme, but when I take samples of size 25, extreme individuals wash out, right? So say that I'm taking average heights. If, if I just get a hundred people and plot their heights, some person might be six foot seven, and that, that's going to be an extreme score in my distribution. My distribution is going to look very variable. But if I take 25 people and get their average height, those averages are all going to be much closer to the average human height because you have one tall person and one small person and a bunch of medium people and it all averages out, right? So when you get these averages, those extreme differences wash out more, okay? And so this is one of those things that the sampling distribution is going to be much tighter, right? Much less variable than the distribution of the population. Now, the other nice thing is even if your parent population is not normally distributed, so if we mess this up and make it look different, right? So this doesn't look much like a bell shape anymore, right? So here's our parent population. Now we can take 25 out of this, right? And we're doing the same process here, taking 25 cases out of the population, and that'll make one mean. Now, what if we do 10,000 of these? Look at this. Even though this distribution is nothing like normal, this distribution is very normal. And we see that the mean of the sampling distribution equals the mean of the population distribution still. And we see that if we took this standard deviation divided by the square root of 25, 5.6 divided by five, that is still appropriately estimated here by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which is the standard error of the mean, okay? So the nice thing here about the sampling distribution is we know what to expect. And so we can map these things out very closely uh, without having to take all possible samples of size N because we know what to expect. We know the long-term expectations of the sampling distribution of the mean. So...